Dr. Pinnell is Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School, Vice Chair of Academic Affairs in the Department of Neurology at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Director of Research for the Division of Epilepsy with a secondary appointment in the Division of Women's Health. She is an expert on hormones and seizure provocation, the pharmacokinetic changes of anti-epileptic drugs with exogenous hormones, or differing re reproductive phases, maternal and fetal outcomes during pregnancy in women with epilepsy. And she has had many collaborative multi-center trials looking into the treatment of women with epilepsy with hormone therapeutics, studying the effects of epilepsy and anti-epileptic drugs on sex steroid hormones and the functional consequences and the study of women with epilepsy during pregnancy. Her current work includes multi-center clinical study across 20 sites, maternal outcomes and neurodevelopmental effects of AEDs, the MONEED study, which is funded by NINDS and NICHD. Dr. Pinnell is the recent past president of the American Epilepsy Society. She served on the board of directors for the American Epilepsy Society, the professional advisory board of the Epilepsy Foundation, director of the epilepsy course of the Neurologic Complications in Pregnant Women course at the annual meetings for the American Academy of Neurology. She has authored over 70 original research manuscripts in the field, 50 review articles and book chapters, AAN guidelines, with a focus on sex-specific and neuroendocrine considerations in epilepsy. She is an amazing mentor and enjoys mentoring junior faculty fellows and works with all of us on building our clinical research skills. I'm so privileged to work with her every day at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and she's taught me so much. She's taken such wonderful care of my patients when they're considering pregnancy or have become pregnant. And you all know, when you know someone really wonderful, you just want to share them with everyone else. And that's what I'm doing today. But more importantly, I really love her mission of helping women with epilepsy have healthy pregnancies and babies, and her life's work of obtaining data to better inform their care. Now, it's not too long ago that it was common for pregnant women with epilepsy to take medications that we now know are harmful to the developing fetus, or even to be told that they should not have children. And I've asked Dr. Pinnell to provide us all with an update on women with epilepsy and pregnancy, and then to take questions from the audience. This session is being recorded and will be posted so we can continue to spread this education to as many people as possible. So when you do ask your questions at the end of her presentation, feel free to not only ask your own individual question, but questions that you want others to know the answer to. And so thank you so much, Dr. Pinnell, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to educate us all. Um, well, thank you, Dr. Milligan, so much for inviting me um, to your wonderful platform you have created for increasing neurology education. And uh, thank you for anyone joining us. Uh, as you heard, I do feel like this is a very important topic. And I do feel that we've come so far since when I finished fellowship and we were discouraged uh, from um, we were often told to discourage women from with epilepsy from having children. And although it was frustrating, I realized we didn't have the data, we did not have the evidence to allow physicians to know how to manage women with epilepsy during pregnancy or how to counsel them. And so that's where I really got my inspiration from, is from the patients and coming into clinic. So let's see. So um, just to take over a very quick tour of the last 20 years or so of how far we have come. So as many of you know, that we started realizing that not all seizure medications are the same and the risks are not the same for every single one, which makes sense, right? They all are different chemicals, they have different structures. So why would they be all the same? And so we really started gaining a lot of information from pregnancy registries around the world 
about the different risks for major congenital malformations or birth defects, which would require surgery or shorten the life of a child or make a major impact on the daily quality of life of the child. And we have several registries around the world. Um, but then uh, my uh, colleague, Dr. Kimford Metter, really brought to light the fact that we shouldn't think about exposure just in the first trimester. We should think about what about the ex exposure to the fetus throughout all three trimesters of pregnancy and are there effects on fetal brain development? And so I will show you the findings from his initial need study and how that really has changed practice. Um, and then this was all in light of, as we started using the newer medications, we were getting reports that, oh no, women were having seizure breakthroughs, pregnancy was making their seizures worse and this is a horrible situation. And so then we started doing work and realizing that pregnancy was a unique situation in which the clearance of the medications rapidly increased. And if we just made dosage adjustments to maintain the woman's concentration she needs, then we would probably have better seizure control. So I will just um, briefly touch on that as well and spend time talking about the latest findings from our multi-center MONEED study. So how do we handle this dilemma, especially as treating practitioners? How do we maintain a woman's seizure control, but yet within the context of knowing that the medications could have harmful effects? So this is a slide actually from Torborn Thompson, who runs the URAP registry. And despite the name, it's actually a registry from 42 countries around the world spread over, I believe, four continents. So it's not just European. Um, and so the findings from Europe are in the circles. And then we have the North American AD Pregnancy Registry run by Lewis Holmes at MGH and Sonia Hernandez-Diaz at the School of Public Health here at Harvard in the um, triangles. And then the UK and Ireland Epilepsy and Pregnancy Register also has publications with a, a different cohort. And what you wanna see are similar signals. So this is the rate of malformation. So remember that in the general population, the chance that a pregnancy results in a child with a birth defect is around 2%. So when you look at these medications, we now have evidence that their rates of malformations are quite low and with relatively tight confidence intervals with rates from, um, with a confidence interval, you can see even going down around zero, but up to as high as uh, four or 5%. So with these medications, um, these are the ones that we have consistent signals that the rates of malformations are low. So levotracetam, lamotrigine, and now oxcarbazepine. Then we have these medications in the middle with higher malformation rates and wider and or wider confidence intervals. Only recently from URAP, we, they actually had data that um, oxcarbazepine has lower malformation rates than carbamazepine in their study. And then all three registries, and there's other types of studies as well, have consistently shown this very high rate of malformations for valproate, whether in monotherapy or polytherapy. These numbers are reflecting monotherapy, but again, in polytherapy, there's much higher risk with malformations if it includes valproate. So um, as I mentioned, then we started paying attention to what about the effects throughout all of pregnancy. And this is the neurodevelopmental effects of anti-epileptic drug study, of which I was a site PI, but it was really led by um, Dr. Kimford Metter. And so he fought, we followed the children after they were exposed to one of these four medications in utero and followed them until age six with detailed IQ testing and then several other measures. So this is the... Um, the full-scale IQ here on the y-axis, and um, we're also showing differences related to the dose. So what I want you to see, first of all, is that the IQ was lower for valproate compared to the children exposed to either of the three other medicines, but there was also a dose-dependent effect. So this also shows us that not only does valproate have higher risk, but we also have to think about how much exposure and not having overexposure of the medication during pregnancy if it is not needed for seizure control. Um, so then we kind of come to where we are now. So what? A, so you could think, well, um, these medications have these negative effects, so we should maybe not treat with medications or under treat them, but we cannot forget about our primary 
responsibility is to treatment of the woman and what are the effects of seizures. So we all know the effects of seizures can be incredibly devastating if someone's seizure free and she can no longer drive and have all kinds of other effects. But we also know even a seizure that could cause um, an impact to the abdomen, the lower abdomen can actually be uh, actual cause fetal demise. So we really wanna avoid seizures that can cause any kind of blunt trauma. And we also want to avoid seizures that are convulsive that result in hypoxia and prolonged acidosis. There are a few studies that look at the uh, risk of seizures. And so it's more clear for the generalized tonic-clonic convulsions um, all seizure types have been shown in large epidemiologic studies that maybe any seizure can increase the risk for low birth weight, small for gestational age or preterm delivery, but that's less clear. But the convulsions we definitely want to um, avoid. And when you look at maternal mortality in particular, there's a, a couple studies, one from Denmark and the other one from the UK that show that the risk for death during pregnancy or shortly after uh, pregnancy is quite a bit higher if the woman has epilepsy. So the maternal mortality ratio in pregnant women with epilepsy compared to healthy pregnant women was, um, was 5.57 times higher for women with epilepsy, the odds ratio. Then the study from UK, they have a mandatory uh, maternal death registry. So they get um, information on any woman who dies during pregnancy or shortly after delivery. And with that, they, all, they found approximately a tenfold increased risk of death in pregnant women with epilepsy. But they also had information where they could look at the causes of death and medical records. And they felt that based upon their review that over a half to 90% of the pregnant women with epilepsy that died were actually due to sudden unexplained or sudden unexpected death and epilepsy. Um, so it's something that we cannot take lightly, and it's really important to not undertreat women and let their seizures get worse. So does pregnancy make seizures worse? Again, we didn't have evidence to be able to counsel the woman, to know how to manage them. And if you look at the literature, it's really all over the place that some say 10% will get worse and some say 75% will get worse. And these other studies, they talk about maybe some of the factors are baseline seizure frequency going into pregnancy, adherence, um, and also several of them do show a benefit for use of therapeutic drug monitoring. So getting medication levels throughout pregnancy and making medication adjustments to maintain that person's individualized target concentration. So that brings us to the MONEED study. Uh, maternal outcomes and neurodevelopmental effects of anti-epileptic drugs. And uh, this is with Dr. Kimford Metter and myself as multi-PIs. And then we have many other wonderful collaborators um, across the 20 clinical sites, but also cores, which include psychiatry, pharmacokinetics, semiology, neonatal. Um, what we did is we enrolled 355 pregnant women with epilepsy. Uh, and compared them to two control groups, pregnant healthy controls and non-pregnant women with epilepsy. And what we did is we wanted to design the study to look at six major outcomes. And we actually based this upon the American Academy of Neurology practice parameter guidelines that were published in 2009. So that series of guidelines, which was a three paper series, said we don't have enough information to know this, we don't have enough information to know that, et cetera, and down the list. So based upon that, we wanted to know, does pregnancy in of itself change seizure frequency? What are the risks of obstetric complications compared to our healthy pregnant women? What about rates of depression during pregnancy and postpartum compared to the healthy pregnant woman and compared to the non-pregnant woman with epilepsy? And what about the child outcomes? Um, what are the effects on neurodevelopment followed until age six? What are the neonatal complications? Are there higher rates of admission to the neonatal intensive care unit, for instance? And what is the impact of breastfeeding? And this time we did it within the context of a pharmacokinetic model with obtaining sampling throughout pregnancy and postpartum and also samples at birth of umbilical cord and of the child, children who were breastfeeding. So just to first show you what, what did our cohort look like. So this is observational. We cannot change, nor would we ever change um, treatment um, for 
uh, for the sake of the study. And so you can see how many, this is the number of pregnant women with epilepsy subjects. So the majority were on lamotrigine monotherapy or levetiracetam monotherapy. We also saw a lot of this uh, lamotrigine with levetiracetam in combination in particular. We had other polytherapy combos, um, carbamazepine monotherapy, zonisamide monotherapy, oxcarbazepine, topiramate, lacosamide, um, felbamate monotherapy, uh, very unexpected, some other monotherapies. And then um, in comparison to the NEAT study that was only 12 years um, prior to it, we had hardly any women on valproic acid. Only four women were on valproic acid in monotherapy or polytherapy combination. We also looked at what was the breakdown if they had generalized seizure types, focal seizure types, or unclassified. So many of you probably know the real problem has been what to do with a woman with a primary generalized epilepsy, such as juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, and she's doing well on valpro monotherapy. What do we do in her situation? And so that's where I think you see a lot of the other options coming in. We saw a lot of zonisamide monotherapy being used for this situation and also this combination or um, individually. Um, also, I'll just say this, um, this pattern mirrors very well what was reported in the URAP pregnancy registry that was um, published just this past year. So this is similar to what is happening in the real world and not just uh, limited to our sites. So I'll go through this a little bit more click quickly, but what we want to do is look at what changes occur in the clearance of the medications during pregnancy. So let me take just a minute to explain this because it's a little bit backwards from how um, we have reported this before. So we looked at what the concentrations were in the blood during the postpartum state because that's our non-pregnant baseline. Um, so during non-pregnant state, what is the concentration relative to the dose? So the dose normalized concentration. And then during pregnancy in the first trimester for lamotrigine for that same dose of medicine, the concentration would be significantly lower than the non-pregnant state. Um, you can see quite a bit lower. And then again, lower, significantly even lower in trimester two. And then um, trimester three and two and three are about the same. And this is at delivery. So this actually does repl replicate prior work by our group that was done from a single site when I was at Emory University, but now this is you know, much larger numbers of women, 143. Um, to show these differences. Okay, so now that hopefully you have that, uh, that uh, background of how we did the graphs, I'll go a little bit more quickly. So, you know, when we started using Lamotrigine, we thought, wow, it has low malformation rates. It's really, you know, good for neurodevelopment, but, oh, it's a, kind of a pain to use, right? You have to get, um, I get, levels monthly and you have to adjust the dose. So of course, shouldn't the other medications be better? So everyone thought, well, levetiracetam will be much better, but indeed it's not. So here's levetiracetam. Here's the dose normalized concentration, non-pregnant, and it is again, significantly lower right away in trimester one, trimester two, trimester three. So that's because renal clearance also increases dramatically as soon as someone is pregnant. So you can't wait until they gain weight. It's not about weight gain at all. Um, really, as soon as we find out they're pregnant, we start getting uh, medication levels monthly. Um, and then zonisamide. Oh, here we go again. So again, we have to worry about the fact that the dose normalized concentration, the concentrations decrease again, um, significant by trimester two, but as you can see, we didn't have as many women on zonisamide. So um, at least by trimester two and trimester three is lower. And here's oxcarbazepine, again, lower concentrations if you don't change the dose in the, in, uh, during pregnancy compared to the non-pregnant baseline. And lacosamide, we just pulled this data because we're starting to see this used more in pregnancy, even though we don't have a lot of data about it um, for other teratogenic effects, but we are seeing it uh, much more often. And so again, lacosamide, which again is renally cleared, so not surprising, has lower concentrations during pregnancy compared to the non-pregnant baseline. About the really only exception, um, as reported by Emily Johnson um, when she was here with us and also shown in this, is that carbamazepine, if you look at the free concentration, there's really no changes, significant changes in the epoxide. The total 
there's a little bit of a change, but what we really care about with carb is because it's so highly protein bound, we really care about the free unbound concentration. And so that's one medication that, you know, if you are in a situation where it's hard to do therapeutic drug monitoring and a woman has focal seizures, this is a medication that um, is probably okay not to monitor as frequently. Okay, so going back to the guidelines I mentioned. So as I said, there were three parts. So one of them was also what happens to changes in seizure frequency. So what the guidelines said at that time is that no study compared the change in seizure frequency in pregnant women to the gold standard, which is non-pregnant women with epilepsy. Therefore, all studies that were done thus far were graded as class four studies. So there is insufficient evidence to determine the change in seizure frequency in pregnant women with epilepsy. So um, I'd like to review this article that was recently published in New England Journal of Medicine, came out on Christmas Eve, nice Christmas present for us. Um, and so going back to the study design. So as you um, saw on the first slide, we enrolled women with epilepsy who are pregnant up to 20 weeks. Um, that was really just for practicality to be able to get the numbers we needed. So we went until 20 weeks and we enrolled non-pregnant women with epilepsy and we followed them exactly the same way where they would come in for visits three times throughout pregnancy, at delivery, and then um, at three months, six months, and nine months postpartum. So the non-pregnant women with epilepsy obviously were not pregnant, but we followed them exactly the same way. And what we did is we had an app built for us by iRODI and it had a daily diary for um, medication doses, if they missed a medication, if they had a seizure, what type, how long it lasted. And we also looked at several other things. You can see this is a breastfeeding icon. We looked at mood, we looked at sleep, really a lot of different things that we'll be able to continue to evaluate over time. The other important thing is the non-pregnant women with epilepsy, we looked at our enrollment every week of our our study group, pregnant women with epilepsy. And then we looked to make sure that we selected non-pregnant women with epilepsy that were similar. So we wanted the same age, of course, uh, similar demographics for race and ethnicity, but we also wanted them balanced on what type of seizures they had, what type of epilepsy syndrome, how frequent their seizures were, how good was their control, and also the medications, the anti-seizure medicines they were taking so that we could do a um, appropriate comparison. So what we found um, was actually there were no differences. So if you followed, as we followed women during pregnancy, 23% um, of them had an increase in their seizure frequency compared to their non-pregnant baseline. So this was any increase. So say if they had um, one seizure every three months and then during pregnancy, they had 1.5 seizures every three months, that counted as an increase. So any increase. The, the other important, Point and thing, important thing also is if they were seizure free, it was really important if they had just one seizure breakthrough. And we specifically for our primary aim focused on seizures that impair awareness because of the um, great impact on the woman's quality of life. Um, so this included convulsions, it included focal impaired aware seizures, it included obsolescence. Now controls that were followed again the same way, 25% of them had an increase in frequency of their seizures above their baseline. So there were no differences. 62 and 65% had no change in seizure frequency. 14% of pregnant women had seizure improvement and 11% of controls had seizure improvement. So no differences. We also broke it down by seizure types. So impaired awareness, uh, focal impaired aware, all seizures, convulsive seizures, um, focal seizures. And we also broke it down by trimesters. So this is worsening, this is stable, this is um, seizure improvement in the color scheme here. And again, there were no differences if broken down by seizure types or by trimester with one small exception is that focal seizures, which is down here, um, slightly higher percentage of women that were pregnant had focal seizure worsening uh, in the second trimester compared to the non-pregnant women with epilepsy. But after we corrected for multiple comparisons, it was no longer significant. 
Now, how the groups did differ, and this is really the part of the story that is important for us clinically, is how they did differ is in the second part of the graph. So what happened with their medications? So 74% of the women, pregnant women, had a change in the dose of medication. And um, I'll show you next that most of them had an increase in the dose of their medication during pregnancy. Whereas compared to controls, only 31% had a change in dose of medication. So that was where a big difference was in how they were managed during those periods of time. When we looked in more detail, um, these, we broke it down by medications. So here's lamotrigine, levotracetam, oxcar, zonisamide, carbamazepine, and topiramate. Here the red is dose increase and the blue is dose decrease. So what you can see for lamotrigine in the pregnant woman is a dose increases in the first trimester, a lot in the second trimester, and then the third trimester and following delivery dose decreases. Now this is in comparison to the controls. So you have the same X axis, I mean Y axis, sorry. And you have a much lower percentage of women who had these dose changes on lamotrigine in the non-pregnant group. Same thing for levotracetam here, oxcarbazepine, zonisamide. Now carb is a little bit mixed, as we said, um, based upon also the pharmacokinetics and also uh, differences uh, between the two groups in topiramate. And what I really like about this graph is it actually mimics what we saw with the pharmacokinetic changes for each of these medications during pregnancy. So it's somewhat satisfying to see that over 20 sites that people were actually adjusting the medications. We were not telling them at all how to manage um, the women. And I, I was actually surprised um, that it was as uniform as it was um, across all these sites. So for the 23% of women who did have increased seizures, we wanted to see what the risk factors were. And we looked at several things, but really the only risk factor that stood out is if they were seizure free in the nine months prior to conception, their odds ratio of having seizure worsening was much lower, 0.26. So if a woman goes into pregnancy seizure free, um, she's likely to stay seizure free as long as, um, you know, likely you make medication adjustments. And so that's another really hopeful sign to tell our women who come in and ask us for advice about what's gonna happen during pregnancy. And what I really find is actually it's, it's the patient herself a little bit, but it's really her partner and her parents or other family members who are really so worried, appropriately so, is she gonna get worse? Is she gonna have seizure breakthrough? Is she gonna have seizure worsening? I don't want her to go through pregnancy if it's gonna put, get, um, put a risk on her. So I'm so glad that we now have this information that we can provide hope to these patients and families. So just a couple other things. Um, breastfeeding, you know, it used to be controversial. Uh, I like to think it's not as controversial anymore but um, I'm sure it's mixed. So the thought is during pregnancy, women you know, have to take these medications, most of them, and have exposure to the developing fetus, but after delivery, it's, it is optional. So um, what was done in the NEAT study is we looked to see if the children were breastfed, did they have lower IQ scores when they were older because of the continued effects of the medication on the newborn infant brain that continues to develop. And so in that study, 44% of women breastfed their children. And when we looked after a lot of adjustments, at, when we looked at age six-year-old mean adjusted IQ scores, the children that were breastfed actually had higher um, verbal abilities in particular and higher IQ. And again, this was adjusted for maternal IQ and socioeconomic status and other things. So just like in the general population, there seems to be some neurodevelopmental benefit to breastfeeding, and even despite the fact that medications are in breast milk. So this is a recent paper by Angela Birnbaum and our group, and we looked at the concentrations in the nursing infant, usually drawn between six weeks old and three months old, um, to see what were the concentrations in the baby's blood who was breastfeeding. And so this is a um, percentage of maternal concentration. So you can see the concentrations were very low for carbamazepine and epoxide, 
still quite low for lamotrigine. This is similar to a prior paper. We had about 30% of moms blood level. Levotracetam was very, very low. Um, in fact, a lot of the infants, we couldn't even measure the level. Um, oxcarbazepine was low, but not that, you know, not as many subjects. And zonisamide was uh, sort of medium, but again, to caution, these are very few subjects as opposed to these uh, two graphs. Now, when we look at umbilical cord levels, which I um, don't have in a slide, the concentrations are similar to mom. So by breastfeeding, the concentrations that are in the child's bloodstream are so low um, that it provides reassurance. So I just wanna take a minute to um, thank especially the, the women and family members uh, who also participated in Monique and of course allowing their children uh, to participate after delivery as we follow them until age six. And we'll have many other papers hopefully coming out here in the next, um, over the next few years. Um, our children are hitting six years old now, starting to hit six and our, it'll be um, about two and a half more years until our last child reaches six years old. Um, so just in summary, what we do know is this is sort of, this is my um, summary, so it's nothing official, but what are the risk of the medications going back to malformation rates? And also if we know if they are safe during neurodevelopment, um, lamotrigine and levotracetam at this point are the safest. Then the next um, I put here, oxcarb and zonisamide, because they have those low malformation rates, but we don't know yet about the effects on neurodevelopment. Carbamazepine has a little bit higher um, malformation rate, but we know that the children do quite well in neurodevelopment. So I sort of loop, um, lump them together. Then the next higher, uh, uh, the group with higher risk is phenytoin, phenobarbital, topiramate, um, especially also has some problems with low birth weight um, and oral clefts. And then valproic acid is the highest risk for neurodevelopment. I also didn't um, go into details. There's also higher risk for autism with children exposed to valproic acid prenatally. Um, and just remember, there's so many medicines we can't even put in the bubble. So we have a lot of work still to do, uh, you know, many more medications that we uh, continue to collect information on. So with that, I wanna thank you so much for your time and your interest. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Pinnell. That was just such a great overview. And um, I have a, I, I know that there's questions from the audience, but we may not be able to get to many questions at this point. Um, I do have some questions that people have already submitted. And so I'm going to um, continue asking the questions and then we'll be able to post those for the audience. Um, so I would just wanna thank everybody for attending and um, look forward to uh, sharing the answer to Dr. Pinnell's questions with you all at a later date.